we are ready to go. Well, thank you, Patrick, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to spend some time talking you and a little bit through Qt 5.14, our latest release, about what, what we've added there, the new features we have there, also going a little bit into the tooling side of things, uh, Qt Creator, Qt Design Studio, and I'll end up with a small outlook also towards Qt 6, because some of the work that we're doing in 5.14 is actually preparations towards that larger release, Qt 6, that we're planning for the end of this year. So let's get started. But we, before we dive into Qt 5.14, um, just a quick look at our ecosystem around, uh, ecosystem. We've been actually growing very nicely in terms of our download numbers and in terms of our users uh, over the last couple of years. If you look at those numbers since Qt 2016, over the last three years, since Qt 5.7 approximately, we have been growing more than 50% in terms of, of, of downloads and, and of our users. And that, that's a fantastic number. It shows that Qt is alive, that it's used, and that we're getting many, many new users also over the last couple of years. Quick look at over, or an overview over our roadmap, how are things looking currently. Um, we have released uh, a bit more than a year ago, Qt 5.12, um, as a long-term supported release. We have then done 5.13 in June and 5.14 now in actually um, end of November, beginning of December. This is what we're going to be mainly talking about today. But to just give you the outlook, what's then coming uh, is Qt 5.15 as another, another long-term supported release in May and Qt 6.0 uh, as the next major, really large, big release that we have been planning for end of this year. But let's have a look and, uh, into 5.14 and what, what's coming there. Um, start off with some of the smaller items uh, that uh, are there and, and go then into some of the bigger items. Um, Smaller things that we've been doing is, is uh, we've added uh, now support for Windows 7, Windows 8 in Qt Bluetooth, uh, in the Bluetooth module, something very nice for people who are still a little bit on the older versions of, of Windows. Um, we've done something that we do pretty much every release is updating Qt Web Engine to the latest version of Chromium. This time it's Chromium 77. And added, of course, that also implies that you're getting all the good new features that are available in the new version of Chromium. In multimedia, we've done a little bit of work, uh, added YUV422P support um, and a couple of other smaller things uh, like the Open an OpenGL GStreamer plugin, OpenGL based, giving you better hardware acceleration, better uh, better support there. And we've done, of course, tons of smaller improvements and bug fixes. So that's sort of, you know, a little bit the small things, but there's a couple of actually a bit, bit larger things that have happened. And let's go through those now. Start off with Qt Core and Qt Network. Um, a big new feature that we've added in Qt Core is uh, adding support for different calendaring systems through the new Qt Calendar class. This is something that integrates with Qt date Qt, Qt, and Qt date time and adds support for different uh, non-Western calendaring systems. Qt so far and through Qt date time has only supported the Gregorian Western calendar, but we've now added through Qt calendar also support for different versions, Jalali, Persian calendar, Islamic calendar, Milankovitch and Julian calendars. And the plan here is to add more and uh, calendaring systems uh, now also then moving forward into 5.15 and 6. Um, we've added a, a QColor constants class. It's a namespace that provides uh, const expression QColor instances, removing quite a bit of cut runtime overhead if you want to instantiate colors that you know the name of at compile time. On the networking side, um, We've added a new API to allow configuring HTTP 2 connections. 
um, we introduced um, monitoring for network connectivity and it's a little bit of an API there. And uh, we are now supporting also Kerberos proxy authentication. So good new set of features there is, uh, if, you have, if you use Kerberos behind proxies, I think you'll probably value that one. Um, in Qt GUI, we've done also quite a bit of uh, some work there. We've added uh, color space for support for QImage. Um, we can now read and write color spaces from JPEGs, PNG, PNGs, WebP, and TIFF images. Um, we support color space transformations on images, so you can convert those and we can render them color correct on your display. This is something that's really important if, if you really need full 100% color correct display of images. This is uh, part of a lot larger move and strategy or from our side to really bring a full color space support everywhere into Qt. We've done a few improvements to our Qt text document and Qt text table handling um, where we added then per edge border studying so you can configure every edge edge in a uh, in a table or in a cell in the text table cell or in the, in, in the table style them differently can we have support for collapsing borders and uh, added also with that a support for uh, HTML table styling in our HTML importer and exporter. As it's mostly there. There's a couple of small features that are probably still not supported, but should give you, if you're using HTML table styling, much, much better uh, improved uh, visual layout and rendering of, of tables, HTML-based tables. And of course, since QText document is the basis for um, QText edit in, on the widget side and also the text uh, text edit component on, on the QML side, uh, those features are then also available both in QText edit and QText browser on the widget side and in QML, and the text elements in QML. We've also added support for reading and writing markdown formats in QText document as an alternative to HTML. Markdown has become rather popular over the last years and uh, we've been reacting to that now by adding support for that format as an import and export format. Another big change in Qt GUI is that we've updated uh, and done further work on our high DPI support. Uh, with Qt 5.14, we now support non-integer scaling factors, something that has, has been requested for quite a while and that's pretty important, especially on the Windows platform, where many of, where man, one can set uh, scale factors as, for example, 150%. Uh, on macOS, scale factors are in, always an integer. It's two or three macOS and iOS, but on Windows, those can be non-integer scaling factors. And when a rounding is needed, for example, because you're running on macOS, um, there's a now a new rounding policy available as a, a API available that where you can set the rounding policy. How how should the rounding happen? Um, we've also added a new Qt enable high DPI scaling environment variable that does the scaling based on the display DPI and replaces uh, the now deprecated Qt auto screen scale factor. It basically corresponds to the Qt uh, uh, enable high DPI scaling appli application attribute and should be used instead now. And finally, we've also added cross platform support for. Uh, the Qt font DPI environment variable. That's something that helps you simplify development testing um, by uh, emulating certain specific DPI values on, on all platforms. So you can really test how your application will look with different um, scaling factors. Qt 3D has gotten uh, quite a few improvements. Um, uh, there has been a larger overhaul over the threading architecture in Qt 3D, um, which also removes what has been called the aspect thread, something that has been an implementation detail in, in the past, but it was one additional thread that things had to be routed through, uh, causing some overhead. 
there has been also an overhaul over the uh, node syncing between the front end and the back end classes. Uh, both of those have um, had uh, have been done to improve performance and have had a significant impact in that area, removing a lot of of CPU load and uh, and making Q3D in general more performant. Uh, Q3D core Q transform now has access to the world matrix, simplifying your application logic. And we've gotten a new scene 3D view class uh, for uh, or QML item, which allows showing Qt 3D scenes uh, in Qt Quick and where you can have several of those in, in one Qt Quick based applications. Before we only had scenes 3D and you could have at most one of them. But what we're now also doing is that Scenes 3D is synced with Qt Quick in terms of animations and, and other things uh, in, in the scene graph. So that should help reduce rendering artifacts and, and things being out of sync between the two sides. And Scenes 3D finally can also render as an underlay uh, into, into a Qt Quick window without requiring an FBO, helping significantly again on the performance side. Android has gotten uh, some updates. We now, since Qt 5.14, require uh, the uh, release 20 uh, NDK. Um, and with that, we've also added support for multi-ABI builds in one go. So um, you can now build uh, multiple architectures in one go um, using both, both QMake and CMake. Um, by, by default, all Android supported ABIs are built. So ARM64, V8, um, ARM V7, uh, X64, uh, and X86. You can fine tune that using the Android ABIs QMake variable and select specific APIs there. We've added support for the new uh, AAB package format in, on Android, uh, and that makes it much easier to deploy to the Google Play Store um, because you can now create a single, using the multi-ABI builds, you can create a single application bundle that contains all binaries uh, for all supported ABIs and upload those in one go to the Play Store. And then finally, um, We've done a major change in Qt 5.14 with our new graphics architecture that we're introducing for the first time here. And that requires a little bit more explanation and work. So let's go through that one a, a bit more in detail. Um, in so far in Qt 5, in the Qt 5 series, we have relied very heavily on OpenGL as our backend for doing hardware accelerated graphics as the, the AP underlying API. We've been using that throughout all platforms, both uh, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, uh, on the embedded side. But what we've seen now over the, over the last years is that there has been a change in that area. We have been getting new graphics APIs coming in. So Apple has started with Metal and, and pushing that one. Um, the Kronos Group has been uh, now adding Vulkan as, as the pref preferred successor for, for OpenGL um, and is pushing that one. This is going to become the default API on Android and um, in the future, most likely also on many embedded Linux devices. And on Windows, we of course have also direct 3D. So with that, um, there's a big need for us now to basically see how we and how Qt can work with all those different 3D graphics APIs. And of course, Qt being a cross-platform tool, we want to make this easy. We want to make sure that we can abstract the differences away. To do that, we have now with Qt 5.14, that's the first time, added a, what we call a Qt rendering hardware interface, a new interface to help with those graphics, uh, abstract those away. I'll come back to more details on that in the next slide. Going one step higher, what we've also seen is that uh, many of our users now want to also add 3D content more easily to the user interfaces, especially uh, combine that with uh, the Qt Quick and the 2D UI technologies. And 
that has been difficult so far because um, you could then combine Qt Quick with either Qt 3D or Qt 3D Studio, but you had two different scene graphs. They were not really synced and it was really, really difficult to do um, synchronization between, between the two. We had some runtime overhead because one of the two needed to be drawn into frame buffer. That's something that we're fixing right now and where we're trying to bring those together into a combined scene graph. Of course, there's still also some software rendering part for, for low-end hardware where you can rest, rasterize Qt Quick through software, but uh, those stay as they are. And then finally, on the top level, uh, the tooling side of things, um, we also had two different tools with Qt Design Studio for 2D Qt Quick based user interfaces and Qt 3D Studio for 3D um, UI layout and design. And um, that has not been ideal and we want, we are now working and combining those into one application with Qt Design Studio and then have also available good import tools for importing from both 2D and 3D content creation tools such as Photoshop, Sketch, Autodesk Maya or Blender. Let's have a look into the details of what's available right now in 5.14. Let's start off at the, again at the bottom with the rendering hardware interface. As I said, it's an abstraction layer for 3D graphics APIs. For the moment, it's an internal API that we're tuning towards the needs that we have in Qt. And basically it abstracts graphical objects, materials, meshes, shaders, and other things. Integrates with the Qt platform uh, abstraction API so that we can integrate with the windowing system. Um, and we'll, we're also providing cross-platform shaders using the shader tools module. I have a separate slide on that one in a second. Um, the APIs we're supporting here now are OpenGL 2.1 or OpenGL ES 2.0 and newer. We're supporting Vulkan 1.0 and 1.1, Direct 3D 11, and Metal on macOS. And it's currently used by the 2D piece of Qt Quick, uh, the existing Qt Quick as you know it from before Qt 5.14. And there it optionally replaces the OpenGL renderer that we have here. So instead of going through the OpenGL renderer to render Qt 3D, you can now go choosing a simple environment variable through the rendering hardware interface, choosing that and with that um, get the get Qt to use the native um, APIs underneath on the on the different platforms. So we would then be using Metal, Metal by default on, on Mac OS and iOS, Direct3D on Windows. This is supported as a technology preview in 5.14 and in 5.15 we're aiming and having that fully supported uh, and fully ready for your use. One thing that comes with that is of course that we need to handle shaders a little slightly different. Um, Currently, shaders that you write, for example, if you do a cute quick shader uh, uh, effect or other things, uh, have been written in GLSL um, and have been OpenGL specific. If we now want to move away and support different graphics APIs, we need to be able to deal with those and, and have, sh of course, we also want to make sure that you only have to write your shader once. So in order to allow that, we are now building uh, the whole acute shader tools infrastructure on top of what's called the Spear V open source ecosystem. This is a, a Kronos effort, which is Spear V is the native shading language for Vulkan. But what they have, there's also a cross compiler that can cross compile Spear V to GLSL uh, for, for OpenGL, HLSL for Direct3D and MSL for Metal. So the way this works now is that you write uh, your shader one uh, once in a Vulkan style GLSL, very similar to the current uh, GLSL for OpenGL. And then we can cross compile that into all the different shading languages that are required. Um, this, uh, and bring those into a package that you, uh, shader package and, and the shader binary that you can then use. Um, this moves more towards offline processing of, of, of the shaders. Uh, so you do the shader conditioning and compilation during build time, not at runtime. 
Um, this is also something that's there as, a, as an additional module right now in 5.14 um, as, an app, uh, as, a, as a labs module. You can already start using that and this will become a more integrated part in, of Qt in moving forward. To support uh, 3D content in Qt Quick now, this was the next level, one level up from, from the rendering hardware interface to Qt Quick. Um, we are basically now combining the scene graphs. So when in Qt 5.12 or 5.13, you had to use two different scene graphs for 2D and for 3D, you can combine those now in, in one scene graph and have Qt Quick on top of both of those. This is a little bit how it looks like. We have now a new module called Qt Quick 3D. It's built on top of QML as a language. Um, so all QML language features are available. You have, can easily create reusable con components. We have unified animations and state transitions for 2D and 3D. That's really important because that has been very, very hard to achieve before. Um, and, and that means that animations will be really synced frame by frame between the 2D and 3D side. You can combine that with existing Qt Quick APIs by simply adding another import. And it's uh, aimed as a high level, easy to use API for 3D content. License-wise, it's available under GPL and commercial as a technology preview in 5.14. And also here, we will fully support that in 5.15. You can see an example on the right-hand side there where we have uh, create a window we create a 2D image element, uh, and then we combine that very easily uh, with a three view 3D with a 3D piece, where we can inside this 3D view set up an environment with the light with lights, lightning, lighting, um, a camera, and then we have a model, which is in this case a cube and the glass material connected to that model. We can have an anima uh, a simple sequential animation connected to that one, for example, for the rotation of the cube. Very easy to use in this case, and very intuitive API. Um, what's also worth noting here is that Qt 5.14 and 5.15 for us are also something where we try to basically pave a little bit the road towards Qt 6. We want to already ease porting towards the, the upcoming Qt 6 version by flagging some deprecated functionality for you, so you know about that early on. And we introduced some Qt6 functionality, as you already seen now with uh, the whole new graphics stack. This is some functionality that will actually come to full use and, and will be the full default in Qt6, um, where we then move more things over to that new functionality. We're also planning to, for example, provide you at some point with a Qt Painter based on top of based on the rendering hardware interface, so that also widget painting will get benefit from that new infrastructure and can be hardware accelerated in a good way. I'll talk a little bit more about Qt6 uh, in a couple of minutes, but before we go there, let's have a quick look uh, at the tooling uh, side of things and start off with Qt Creator. Um, during, since Qt 5.13 has been released, we had two releases of Qt uh, Creator as far as I know, and there are a couple of new things uh, that have come up in Qt Creator 4.10 and then 4.11. The main focus has been on two items here, and you'll see that in both releases. One of them is the language server protocol, um, which we now fully support. This makes it very easy to get support for new programming languages uh, available in, in Creator, for example, for Python. Um, so Qt for Python uses that, and, and our Python support in Qt uses, uses the language server protocol so that you have a language server for Python, and, and we use that to do the syntax highlighting and code completion in Qt Creator. Um, we've also done a, a lot of work on improving the CMAKE support, where we now support Android targets. Um, uh, we ha you can build single files, and, and we, have, uh, we have some better widgets for widget-based app applications and C++ libraries. And then you can easily also now pin files in the editor. Some new things there. Qt Creator 5.4.11 
which has been released together with 5.14 in December, um, improves on that, um, but also adds new things. So we ha have now experimental support for WebAssembly and for the new Qt4 microcontroller products. That's a little bit to the side of this talk, um, but uh, still in, in, it might be interesting for you to know. On the language server protocol, um, we've now support the semantic highlighting extension and make it easier to configure the Python language server. In CMake, we've done further work to switch to the new to a new file-based API and done lots of stability improvements. So you'll, you should see very nice improvements there in our CMake support if you're using CMake for your own projects. The other tool, big tool that we've been working on is Qt Design Studio. Um, since you might not be quite as familiar with that one as with Qt Creator, take a little bit of a quick intro again on Design Studio. It's a graphical design tool built on top of the Qt Creator application framework. So it's actually, in a way, Qt Creator in this disguise. Um, it has all the functionality available from Qt Creator, but has a designer-centric user interface. You have import, import functionality from content creation tools such as Photoshop um, and Sketch, and you can directly test and deploy in the target platform. The goal for us here is to make a better workflow where visual designers, uh, UI designers, interaction designers can work directly on the same project on the real code base together with the developer, developers and the development teams. Designers can use Design Studio to design the UI, import the graphical assets, create the animations, and preview it actually on the real um, target, whether that's a desktop PC, a mobile phone, or an embedded hardware and validate the designs there. Developer can then use that uh, directly, add and hook it up to the application logic, uh, create the data bindings, but also see the layouts also in Qt Creator. You can see the designs, uh, the designs as just as well as in Design Studio and, and then do the same things. So shortcutting that design development workflow and, and making that much more interactive uh, uh, and, and having a faster iteration cycle there is the goal for us. Um, in the past, we've had two design tools, uh, Qt 3D Studio and Qt Design Studio. And with the unified uh, work that we're doing on the graphical side, um, moving, bringing basically a Qt Quick 3D uh, in there and having the 3D support in Qt Quick, we're also now unifying the tooling side bring all of that into one Qt Design Studio that can support both 3D and 2D and 3D content. Um, and of course, all of that is based on QML and Qt Quick and Qt Quick 3D. Couple of new features that have been happening there. We've had also there two releases since 5.13 came out, Qt Design Studio 1.3 and 1.4 where we've done work uh, and I'll go into a couple of things on in a detail in the next two, three slides um, on improving property editor, timeline animations, um, preview on the visual 3D editor. We've had that supported for alignment and distribution tools, which helps you align your UI better and, and distribute the uh, elements over the screen and improve the binding editor. The property editor is completely rewritten now it allows editing shared properties of multiple selected objects, for example, that, that's very helpful. So you can select uh, all your buttons at once and edit all the properties uh, like the font or something like that at once. Lots of usability improvements in the, with a new layout, a new spring box control, uh, color switching and other things. So this should really simplify your life using, using Qt Quick Designer or the design functionality in Qt Creator. We have now an easing curve editor, which allows you to edit the easing curves for, to control, fine tune and control the animations that you're doing. Um, doing custom keyframe animations. It shows you graphically what's going to happen. Uh, you can just modify them. You can look at tangent handles uh, to control interpolations between keyframes. Make sure those are smooth um, and 
and have lots of tools available there to, to make that easier for you. And then as a preview, we've now added a, a visual editor also for Qt Quick 3D, where you can create and edit 3D scenes. Um, you have direct manipulation tools for those 3D objects in the scene, so you can position them, scale, rotate them. We have also here support for timeline animations and states. Um, we've done some work to help you transition from Qt 3D Studio in case you have been using it in the past and import those projects into Design Studio. Um, lots of view options like um, multiple camera views, giz different gizmos and other things. And of course, inter and interoperability with the scene navigator and the proper ed editor and, and other things. So this is really work in progress. We hope that this will, uh, and this will all be fully supported also we're now moving forward in, in 5.15. Right now, uh, it's a technology preview uh, also in Design Studio 1.4. Finally, uh, I think this is also worthwhile mentioning with uh, Qt 5.14 at the same time, we also introduced the Qt Marketplace. The Qt Marketplace is, act is, is something that we have been publishing now in, in December as a central rallying point for the Qt ecosystem, where developers can meet publishers, where, it, where you have one place to, where you can find extensions uh, to Qt, um, things that help developers, designers to uh, enhance the, the, whatever they're doing with Qt. And uh, anybody can also publish new extensions there, both for, for free or for a price. So it's a new platform that helps also, uh, helps you to find new additional extensions to Qt, new content but also a possibility for some of you to maybe launch new business ideas and publish something there to reach to the whole Qt ecosystem. One million developers that we have globally. Currently, the extensions at launch are available, that are available are mainly new modules that add to the Qt framework, plugins to Qt Creator, some new tools enhancing the Qt experience, and we will expand that in the future moving forward with uh, plugins, for example, also for Design Studio and, and any other things. At launch, um, we had more than 100 extensions already available um, coming from Felgo, our partners of mobile focused and extensions, um, KDE with lots of open source extensions um, and, and frameworks available, KDAP providing some things like um, gamma, the Gamma Ray tool, um, Fork Logic coming with the test tooling and credible build tools helping helping you accelerate your builds on Windows. So lots of different things that we have there. It's worthwhile going and, and checking it out. And this will be something that we'll focus on more also moving forward into 2020. Okay, with that, I think I, I covered most of the topics on, on 5.14 and, and the things that we have released with together with 5.14, Creator Design Studio, the Marketplace. Let's have a little bit of a sneak peek into the future towards Qt 6. Qt 6 is a new major version that we have been, that we ha are planning now for this year and, and that we want to release by the end of this year. And of course, with a new larger major version, there's lots of changes, lots of things that uh, can change, and it's important for you to have an idea of what's, what that is going to be. Um, before we go there, let's have a, I want to share with you a little bit of a look at, at the core values that are there, for, that make Qt valuable for you and for, for our users. Uh, we've sat back a little bit and thought about that, and, and what we came up with are those here. Um, a large developer ecosystem. We have a one more than a million developers out there using Qt on a regular basis. This is really important uh, because it helps, you know, the quality of Qt. It brings brings lots of users. There's there's an ecosystem around there. You can get help. You can find people that know the technology. It's cross-platform, desktop, mobile, embedded. Um, you can use it wherever you want. 
a strong focus on ease of use and in, intuitive APIs, making it easy for you to get used to Qt. And, and with that uh, also comes then uh, um, something that makes, uh, makes it very maintainable, your maintainability of the code that you write with Qt. Of course, stability and then also compatibility has been really, really important that you easily can move from one Qt version to the next also upgrade to new versions of the, and get support for new versions of operating systems without having to worry too much about that because Qt takes care of that for you. Scalable, Qt can run on very small, low-end embedded devices all the way up to very high-end, high complex desktop systems. And then, of course, world-class tools and documentation. So th those are really important. And whatever we do, when we now move towards Qt 6, um, we need to keep those values at the heart of what we're doing while adjusting Qt to the new, new market demands. This is our goal with Qt 6. And that means one of the first and foremost requirements is also that we have a good compatibility between Qt 5. Uh, and they're talking mainly about the latest version of Qt 5 and Qt 6. Our goal is to allow, make it possible for you to uh, to com have one, one co source code base uh, that you can compile both against 5.15 and 6.0 with minimal workarounds at the same time. But of course, we'll also do some house cleaning. We'll remove functionality that has been deprecated in Qt 5. This is required so that we can move forward at a, at a better speed in the future, that we can innovate in Qt 6 and get a lot of new functionality to you. We're doing one change on the build system side. Uh, the build system for Qt 6 will be CMake. Currently, Qt is using QMake to build uh, Qt itself. We're moving that over to CMake uh, as the build system that we're going to have there. Um, that doesn't mean QMake is going away. We will still support QMake throughout the lifetime of Qt 6. So if, if you have a project based on QMake, there's nothing really to worry about. We will continue to support that. If you're, however, using CMake, this will also mean that we, have, um, we will in the future have much better CMake support for you available. With Qt 6, we will start requiring C++ 17. This is um, something that where we now move with uh, the C++ ecosystem. When we moved uh, from, when we did Qt 5.0, we required still C++ 98. With Qt 5.7, we moved over to C++ 11 as the minimum requirement. Now it's about time to move to C++ 17. And we have com on pretty much all our com platforms that we currently support, we also have tool chains and compilers available that do support, fully support C17. So this is a good move. It moves with the new, and it means also we can use internally in Qt all the new functionality available, you can integrate better with standard C, and you can also use all the features available there. We'll do lots of improvements in different areas of Qt. Um, I'll mention just a couple of those. There will be more things. Um, we'll, on the core of Qt, we're doing a couple of changes. We'll require um, Unicode throughout. This means also that we'll move a bit ahead and by default ex um, expect that your source code to be encoded in UTF-8. Um, we will simplify handling of Unicode so that you can use the uh, U prefixes uh, for, for string literals, and we can use those in, in Qt with zero copies. We're doing changes to our container classes to improve memory performance and memory use. There's things we are seeing there that where we can improve performance of, for example, QList, QVector, QHash, and others, and look at how we can provide a better STL compatibility. Um, we're doing changes on our object and type system to make it more versatile and also there give better performance, move more work from runtime over to compile time and make that directly usable by QML, where we currently have to do lots of copying of data and, and, and caching on the QML side. 
we are introducing a new property system that brings uh, the, one of the main concepts, that of properties and property bindings from QML over to C++. Um, so you can, with that new system, also use bindings on the C++ side. This also gives us a vastly better performance for bindings. Um, this is a, will be a huge improvement in terms of the performance and a much better integration, bet hopefully, between QML and C++. On the QML side, um, we are doing um, also lots of changes. QML was uh, released basically in Qt 5 was the first major version where we really had full QML support. And uh, over the years, we've seen a few problems with it. It's still, it's a fantastic technology. It has been fueling a lot of the success of Qt 5, but we believe there are things we can be can do better. One of the things we want to do is introduce optional strong typing. This is something that we've seen is really important for large scale projects um, where people and our users um, have projects with hundreds, thousands of QML files. Strong typing helps then in, in making sure that you can more easily refactor things. JavaScript will be more of an optional feature of QML by, um, we want to remove versioning that has been difficult um, to, uh, to handle for us and for our users. Um, there's a lot of duplication of data structures between QObject and the QML. QML. We want to make sure that we remove that and have only one copy of the data structure and avoid generating those at runtime. Instead, generate them fully at compile time. With that, we hope that we can also compile QML to efficient C++ and native code, something that really will improve performance significantly. We have a lot of um, ideas there and a, a lot of things that we have been doing, for example, also in our Qt for microcontroller project, and we're bringing a lot of that back now to, to full Qt. Support hiding implementation details so that you have private, public, uh, some, some sort of private specifier for, for things in QML and a better tooling integration. Those are our goals. And with that, we will also get much faster application startup, lower CPU utilization. We can save quite a bit on RAM and ROM footprint and with a strong type system really make your life easier. This is our goals for QML. Um, there are many more things that were currently being planned for Qt 6. Um, more than I can go through, this is a little bit of an overview, but there are also things that we're planning to, to look into on, on seeing how can we make things easier for the desktop app, look at styling uh, or for QML, the desktop-based styling and those kind of things. So lots of other things that are coming. But I'll leave it at that for now. We'll probably have lots, quite a few more webinars on Qt 6 uh, during this year where you'll get more details as we move along. With that, I'd like to thank you for now. If you have questions, um, please submit them to the Q&A session and uh, we have a couple, couple more minutes for answering any possible questions you might have. Thank you. So Lars, which uh, one of the changes or new things now in Qt 5.14 uh, which one of those make you excited for the future? I think the the, the biggest structural change and that, that has a long-term impact is certainly the work that we've done on the graphics stack. Um, this is something where we are just bringing, you know, getting rid of that hard dependency cloud OpenGL, having the different, um, being able to support all the other native graphics APIs. Uh, is a huge step forward uh, and then having better 3D support on top of that. And then we're planning now to really for Qt 6 also pull that throughout all of Qt so that we can use that in all different areas, see also how we can how we can leverage that on the for Qt widgets and, and other places. This is, I think, the biggest structural change and, and long-term change that really, really has a huge impact there in 514 for the long term. Um, okay, here's a, the, I've got one question now so far only. Please uh, feel free to answer anything you have. First one is uh, whether Qt 514 has 
backwards compatibility. Of course it has. Uh, 5.14 is fully backwards compatible to uh, the whole Qt 5 series, 5.12, 5.13, 5, um, and also older versions. Um, the second question was, what are the plans for extending 3D support for widgets using OpenGL Metal Vulkan? There's a couple of plans that we're having. Um, first one is that we are looking now into a into a painter, uh, Q painter that uses uh, the rendering hardware interface as the backend for, for for painting operations, similar to the QG, Q OpenGL Paint engine that we currently have, but supporting then all the different graphics APIs. This is one thing. Second thing is that we're looking into similar to uh, what we have with QOpenGL widget now, also having um, a QMetal widget, QVulkan widget, or something like that. And so that you can basically have native drawing surface surfaces uh, available for Metal, metal and Vulkan. Um, good. Then, Another question is, um, do we have any plans on supporting Molten VK in Q to translate Vulkan calls uh, to Metal for iOS and OS X? Um, this is a little bit to the side of Qt because uh, uh, this is something you can already then use to today together with the rendering hardware interface. As far as I know, this already works. You can just uh, use then Vulkan together with Mol the Vulkan API with Molten, v Molten VK and it will translate to iOS. It's a little bit of similar, similar to using Angle on Windows instead of uh, to translate OpenGL to DirectX. That also works and, uh, and is something that you can, can do. Whether we will support that uh, officially in our product is something that we still haven't decided. Okay, any more questions? I think there's one question submitted in the chat. Um, okay. but I'll have a look. It's about the printing possibility from QML to uh, Web Engine View. So far, apparently, there's only the option to have it saved to PDF. Uh, the printing from, that's a good question. I don't I don't know from the top of my head. I have to say um, I'd need to go back and ask ask the people, the team behind, uh, what the idea is. I mean, yes, uh, can't answer that right now. Don't know from my head. Okay, please uh, keep them coming. Uh, yes. uh, plans on WebAssembly for Q in Q six. Uh, the current plan is to continue supporting it, uh, and uh, of course we we try to to improve on things already in five fourteen five fifteen. Um, there we have a couple of things ideas there also questions around integrating with into better into or easier integration between the Qt side uh, and the HTML side of things. Um, but the, in, in general, the, the idea is there is that we'll just continue supporting WebAssembly also in Qt 6. Um, the, another question. You talked about downsizing in Qt compiling size. For Qt for MCU, um, are you planning on creating special widgets for it that are less memory consuming? I haven't been talking about Qt for MCU now in this session. There has been a separate webinar on this one. You can actually look that one up and, and, and go through it. What Qt for MCU does is actually that it creates special widgets and, and a special or special actually QML items and quick items. Qt for MCU is in basically a fully redesigned runtime for micro that allows you to run Qt quick on microcontrollers. And it's only the UI side, it's only a UI runtime, but that one is really, really efficient. So you can, we have examples where you can run uh, rather complex applications. We've had a relatively complex uh, instrument cluster as, as one example, um, which ran on half a megabyte of RAM and around two megabytes of ROM, most of it being graphics assets. And, you know, we, 
using a little bit of 2D acceleration that was available there on that microcontroller. We can run those with smooth animations at 60 frames per second. Looks really, really nice. I can only recommend if you're more interested into that one. Look a bit around on, we have information on, on that one on our website. We have some, there's some YouTube videos showing off those things and there's also one or two web, webinars around it. Okay, any more questions? Well, if not, I'd like to thank you very much for listening, um, taking the time. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and, and was useful to you. And um, I'll hand over to Patrick for some announcement on what's come upcoming in, on the webinar front in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, we have a couple of announcements. For example, the early bird tickets for uh, Q12 Summit 2020 in Palm Springs this May are now available on our website. You can uh, visit cute.io slash qtws20. Uh, if you're interested, I think there are still speaker positions available there too. Uh, you can find the info on the same page, qt.io slash qtws20. Uh, other than that, uh, we have a couple of more free webinars incoming, as always. Uh, you can check our resource center, that one. The address for that one is resources.cute.io. And you can find our webinars under events. So tomorrow, for example, there's a Python and C++ interoperability with Shiboken webinar. Uh, on Friday, we have a Get Started webinar. So if you have friends or colleagues looking to get into Qt, this is a great way to do so. And uh, top of my head uh, for the person in the chat who was interested in Qt for MCUs, on the 4th of February, look out for that one. There's a guest webinar with uh, Verold Engineering. So what they did, uh, they actually show you how to port a ready-made Qt, um, uh, Qt Quick application to Qt for MCUs and the uh, Qt Ultralight rendering engine. Yes, so... Um, that will be that. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and uh, we'll hope to see you next time. Bye.